the ancient and biblical roots of Catholicism. For for me as an evangelical looking into the Catholic Church from the outside, I saw a strange ritualistic kind of church, this kind of antiquated strange priesthood, these priests who looked and dressed and lived differently in the Mass, the words of sacrifice, of strange kind of rituals, uh, repeated prayers, a lifestyle for the Catholic that looked different than what I thought the church was supposed to be, what Christianity was supposed to be. What I didn't know is that the Catholics had a very different paradigm than I did as an evangelical. The paradigm that Dr. Bergsma, my guest this week, explains in full. A paradigm that doesn't see the old covenant as being abolished in the new, but fulfilled, a restored priesthood, a restored kind of actual efficacious sacrifice versus what happened in the Old Testament, anticipating the Messiah. Well, here he is now. This sacrifice actually does something. This priesthood is restored. The apostles and their succession, that was something that actually Christ established and and kept passing on. This is... (laughs) an amazing episode that traces the ancient and biblical roots of Catholicism back to the Old Testament, to the Garden of Eden in terms of of the priesthood, and really brings this new paradigm to light to help, I hope, evangelicals who understand what's happening in the Catholic faith, in the Catholic Church, and for Catholics who understand what's happening in, in their own faith. Because those roots are very intentional, are very deep, and really shows a narrative for how God has worked since the beginning and continues to work today. It really hasn't changed. It has been fulfilled. It has been built upon. It has been redeemed in Christ, but different than we ever would have thought as evangelicals. This is a wonderful episode. Please watch and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcast, make sure you subscribe and follow the show. Leave a rating or review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, because that helps to push the podcast out to new listeners. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you. Please subscribe to this channel. If you like it, enjoy it. Hit the bell so you're notified when you get new videos each and every week. And please do leave a thumbs up and interact in the comments below. Guys, this week I am joined uh, once again uh, by Dr. John Bergsman. He's the professor of theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville, a former Protestant pastor. He's the author of some of the most fantastic books you can get your hands on, including Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Revealing the Jewish Roots of the Church, a Catholic Introduction to the Old Testament, um, a number of other books besides that, Surprised by Scripture, Dr. Bergsma, which is a favorite of mine and listeners, the viewers of this show, and a whole bunch besides that we'll get into as well. Uh, joining us from his mobile office this week, this is awesome, <laughs> John, Dr. Bergsma, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here, and hello. Yeah, Keith is here. Uh, fantastic. Enjoyed it so much last time, and uh, this is our long-awaited reunion. <laughs> it, you know what? It, it is, it is, it is. Uh, listeners wouldn't know this, but in the interim, uh, we met in person at a conference up here in Canada. You came all the way up north and slumbered with us here in Canada, and we, we met in person and said, hey, let's get a date in the show, a uh, date in the calendar for the show, and, and this is it. So that was a while coming, but I'm glad to have you back, Dr. Bergsma. And i got to say, from the mobile office, we've had some different locations of, of guests joining us on the show. We, I had Francis Beckwith way back, I mean, four years ago, from his kitchen table, as his wife Frankie made okay. supper in the background, so you can hear in the, <laughs> the pots, the plates shuffling and the pots going. I, we had a lovely uh, Irish priest try and join us from the line at his bank. He couldn't, he had to go to the <laughs> bank and he couldn't make it, so he called in on his cell phone to try, and I said, that, it not, that wouldn't quite work in the bank lineup. But uh, happy to have you in your mobile office this week for viewers on YouTube to get the full experience. Uh, it's great, and we're glad to have you here. Now, Dr. Bergsma, I, I'm going to call this episode this week, and I haven't really prepped you for this, so hopefully you can roll with it, and I, th- I think you can, is the, the ancient and biblical roots of Catholicism. Because I was thinking about how... Uh, what to talk to you about this this week. And you have all kinds of fantastic books on different aspects, your own story as a Protestant pastor, looking at scripture, the early church, and being kind of convinced of Catholicism. You have uh, a wonderful book on the Dead Sea Scrolls and how that really explains some of the, the Jewish roots of Catholicism and of Christianity. You have a book on the priesthood, which is fantastic, and digging into the kind of the ancient roots of the priesthood. So I thought 
do a little tour, take you on a little tour with us and the listener to talk about, first of all, the, the, the ancient roots of Catholicism and the deep biblical roots of Catholicism. And I think I, maybe want, I want to begin maybe with the, the biblical side, because I know in, in your story, just similar to my story, I was not a Protestant pastor, <laughs> so you have much more training than I do. But encountering the early church for me, the early church fathers, really began to shape my understanding of my, my Christian faith. And then for me to go, wait a second, my Christian faith doesn't look like the early church looked. We don't have the Eucharist, the real presence. We don't have baptism in the same way. We don't have these sacraments in the same way. And though for you, you encountered some of the early church uh, in things like the real presence uh, of the Eucharist, in things like the authority of, of the bishops, which you didn't have, I didn't have, and kind of go, wait a second here, what's going on? So I think for a little bit of a, a, a roadmap for us to, to, to to take down today, to, to drive down, to fall today, I want to think about, first of all, what you encountered in the early church, it, uh, that you then, you know, the ancient roots of, of your faith, how that didn't look like maybe the, the faith you were practicing. And then I want to dig into, even deeper maybe, into the, the Jewish roots of some of the things that we do in the Catholic faith. But let's maybe begin with the the ancient roots in the sense that, okay, so here you were, a Protestant pastor with, with your Bible, with, with scripture, <laughs> but you encounter something like the early church fathers in, in the real presence in the Eucharist, in the importance of the bishop. What did you find in, in that experience? How did that begin to shape your understanding of Catholicism? Can we, can we start there? Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's a great question, Keith, about, um, you know, where was the start of my journey? into the church and really seeing the ancient roots of the church. And what I would say is it really begins with my own Protestant preaching out of the book of Acts. Yeah. And what you see in the book of Acts is this unity between uh, receiving Christ and entering into a relationship with Christ and um, being part of the church. And this was a, a major issue for me as a Protestant evangelist was, for me, it was two steps. There was, um, first of all, establishing a relationship with Jesus through the sinner's prayer, asking the Lord to come into one's life. And then I was always faced with the difficult question of, well, why the church, since I can just have this, this personal relationship with Jesus? Like, why do I need a church? And so I, that raised the question in my mind, like, what was the early church like? Was this always a problem? How did the apostles deal with this? How did the first generations deal with this question of, you know, relationship with Christ and then relationship to church? And when I looked into the book of Acts, I saw this seamless unity between, um, between becoming a Christian and being part of the church. They were one and the same thing. There was no, it was unimaginable that there would be some kind of distinction between being a Christian and being a member of the body, you know? And so that, that really was the beginning there because there's so much behind that. What, what, um, the unspoken assumptions behind that unity between having a relationship with Christ and a relationship with the church involves the authority of the church. Yeah. Um, yeah. if, if there's a unity between Christ and the church, then there then the church is an extension of Christ. And, and to start using theological language that we develop later, you know, we talk about the mystical body, the authority of the magisterium, uh, et cetera. And, and this is the problem. My, my denomination that I was part of, uh, the local congregation that I was pastoring, wasn't, uh, w was in a very imperfect relationship with the mystical body and could not speak with the authority of the mystical body and could not demand the allegiance that the mystical body of Christ can demand that has been in organic unity with the community that Jesus himself established um, 2,000 years ago. Okay, So when you really are the church, you can ask people for loyalty because you are the church. And when you aren't the church, but you're uh, like a parachurch organization started by John Calvin or somebody else, you know, a few hundred years ago, etc., then you don't have the authority to require that adherence. 
and um, and then that um, that authority of the church and that that union of the church with Christ goes back to the covenantal relationship between God and His people that you can pursue all the way back to the opening chapters of Genesis and, yeah, and Adam yeah. and Eve, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's the start of it. And I, I don't know if that, if that makes sense uh, or if that's, it seems too um, far afield, but that's the beginning. And then you start working on all those steps in the process and you, you can point step-by-step step, just demonstrate continuity between, you know, the family established by Adam and Eve, and as that grows into a, a tribe and a people and the nation of Israel and with their temple and their priesthood, etc., and that becomes the kingdom of David, and then the kingdom of David is restored uh, spiritually, but not just spiritually, also in, in, in a very uh, real, tangible way uh, in the church. Um, you know, and, and the church is then the spiritual kingdom of David, manifested in historical time with institutions and people and so on. It's like flesh and blood, but it's the spiritual kingdom of David. And that is the culmination of the whole story of the Old Testament. So uh, that's that's it in a nutshell. So where do we want to go back and jump in on that? <laughs> yeah, and that's, I, that's a fantastic overview. And it's remarkable, first of all, because what you kind of lay out there is that Christianity doesn't really make sense of the Old and New Covenants without this kind of priesthood that begins in the Old Covenant and then is carried on in the New Covenant. You know, the, the, it's a paradigm shift, I think, first of all, that, that goes from this idea that I can just take a Bible, go to seminary, start my own church, my, you know, right. join the denomination, preach, right? Have this kind of mystical, this, this invisible body of Christ that's not really accountable to anybody else because we can kind of shape our own theology from how we understand the Bible and what we, what we teach from that. Like I, I remember as part of your story, right, is the idea that, well, if I'm teaching X in my church and, and people listening to me don't believe X, they can go down the street to a church that teaches X, even though right. our church and their church disagree, right? So you begin to question that kind of idea and the paradigm begins to shift, well, what did the early church look like? And then you see, well, okay, they were, they were ordered. They had, a, they had a structure, they had accountability, they had bishops who had an, an order and this kind of organic growth amongst the bishops. But that goes so much deeper. That, be, that begins in the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. That continues into the New Testament. And you begin to see that it does not make sense apart from, from this framework. And I know this didn't happen f for you overnight, but you, you come to a point where, where you, your, your paradigm shifts so much that you, that you begin to have to look for a church that has these, these deep roots, this priest that has deep roots. It doesn't make sense apart from that, right? I, I right. have a friend who, has, who went to a church who had apostolic elders, right, in their church. Uh -huh. And they, they, they saw the need for, for the leadership of their church, now the non-denominational church, to kind of pass on the authority in, in some kind of succession. They saw the right. need for that. That was very biblical. But somebody began that church. Right. Somebody was the first apostle of that church who said, okay, I'm, I'm the elder. I'll now pass on my eldership through succession. But somebody began that. But, right. you know, what, what you found was a church that had its origin with Christ and the apostles that passed that on, but an even earlier origin, like those apostles, what Christ was doing there, that origin of that priesthood began not just in the old you know, in, in the old covenant with, with the Levitical priesthood, but even, even earlier than that, in, in the Garden of Eden. And this is a, a, a template, a, you know, a roadmap for how God works all through time. And you can't just reinvent that in non-denominational church or, or with John Calvin or Martin Luther, right? Those roots, you, you can't just sever that and begin your own church. Right. Like, that's what, what, what I'm saying. That's not how the, the new covenant works. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, even within our own denomination, we recognized the importance of succession because every pastor was ordained by a group of pastors who had been ordained before him. And so they're of authority. But the problem was, like, there was murkiness 
in the origins of that. Like uh, who who ordained our first guys? Yeah. And I have no idea. I, I, I seriously don't I know who established our first generation of leadership in that group that I used to belong to. But um, but you can see how it kind of we accepted a, a certain kind of principle of succession, but we didn't have a continuity going back to Jesus. And we just didn't ask that awkward question of like, well, who authorized our first guys? And as you say, um, you know, in the Catholic Church, obviously, we make a big deal about being able to trace the succession back to Peter and the apostles to the Lord himself who breathes on them and authorizes them in John 21, right? Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. But then Jesus himself is the biological son and heir of David who lived, uh, you know, a thousand years before Christ was born, but Christ is his descendant, that line of authority of the kingdom of David. And then David um, <clears throat> received a covenant from God to uh, under the terms of which he was son of God and also heir to the priesthood of Melchizedek, uh, who, who the people of Israel regarded as Shem, the son of Noah. And uh, that takes us back to Noah and then, you know, all the way back to Adam, this, this aboriginal priesthood of the first man going back to the beginning of, of human history that uh, David ends up inheriting and that is, you know, uh, passed on to Christ. So there's this kind of continuity of priesthood that runs, you know, from the beginning of human history all the way to uh, the current priests of the Catholic Church. And that kind of con continuity can make a claim on the whole human race, that there's a kind of legitimacy there, there's a kind of a universality there um, that can ask for, um, you know, can ask for the obedience and the loyalty of uh, the human race because it's as old as the human race. And and this was, a, this was a big issue for me when I was in seminary. I noticed that my professors, for example, would talk about uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. And I remember coming to one of my Calvinist professors and saying, well, we call them Orthodox, but are they really Orthodox? Because <laughs> within Calvinist circles, you would say, well, this is heterodox Calvinism and this is Orthodox Calvinism. And you got to kind of left wing Marxist Calvinists. You're kind of like selling out Calvinism for, you know, what we would now call woke ideologies and so on. <laughs> and uh, so we would, we would, you know, we, we had our own categories of orthodoxy within Calvinism, but then there was Eastern orthodoxy, you know, it's a whole different, you know, animal. And, um, and I remember my professor said, well, you know, they're orthodox by their own standards. And, and so I came back and I said, well, what about us then? Are we orthodox? Well, we're orthodox by our standards. Like, and I was like, wait a second, isn't, isn't there some standards that are universal that 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 require the allegiance of all Christians? Is there? And he was talking about traditions too, like the Eastern Orthodox tradition and the Reformed tradition, and you could also talk about like the Wesleyan tradition and so on. And I said, in a, when when the, when these kind of discussions would come up, I'd say, well, is there a tradition? owed loyalty by everybody that has a claim on everyone, you know, and this is that quest, of course, you know, led me into the Catholic Church. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting, just in what you said there about earlier on, the idea of, you know, Christ breathed on the apostles and kind of established them as this as this new covenant priesthood. The A, a big deal is made over the idea that, you know, in, in 1 Timothy 3.16, that all of scripture is, is God-breathed, and that's what makes it authoritative for the Protestant. Right. Well, you know, I know it's not the same term being used, but the same, if we're going to, if we're going to say, okay, God breathed scripture, therefore, is it authoritative? Well, we see Christ breathing on the apostles, isn't isn't that? And that's not really that's not really made, uh, made a big deal of in Protestant circles. In fact, that's that's downplayed, right? The apostles were a, a thing for a time, but the priesthood you know passes away. I suppose Anglican Lutheran would still have a, a, a sense of the the priesthood and some idea in some wings of those two churches. But 
in large measure, for, for most evangelical, say, so Protestants, the idea of the priesthood is that's an old covenant thing, an Old Testament thing that Christ abolished in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. Yet we see Christ right. breathing on, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's an important thing. If Scripture is God-breathed, well, hey, he also breathed on the apostles yeah. in, in this new priesthood, right? Yeah. No, it's huge. He breathes on them and he says to, him, to them, whose sins you uh, forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. And that's huge, Keith. And I don't know why I didn't see this, uh, but um, he, what he's doing is he's giving them this authority to mediate the forgiveness of sins. And that is a specifically priest responsibility. You know, so I invite my evangelical friends, go back to the Old Testament and look at who is given the the authority and the responsibility to mediate the forgiveness of sins. It's not the king, it's not the prophet, the sage, you know, it's the priest. And one key passage in that regard is Leviticus 5, where if you read Leviticus 5 carefully, it says, um, excuse me a moment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm cursed with this sneezing thing. Carefully, you know, it describes how if an Israelite man sins in any one of these ways, he has to confess his sin. And granted, it's not explicit, but if you look at the logic of the passage, it's the priest to whom he has to confess because the priest is being instructed here. Leviticus is really a book of instructions for the priests, and the priest is responsible to make sure that the ritual is performed into God's word. So the you can't keep the priest in the dark about what you've done. Like you can't show up at the tabernacle with a bull and have the priest say, what's going on here? And said, I can't tell you, you know, just <laughs> sacrifice this bull for me. Like, no, you can't do that. Obviously, you had to tell the priest, look, I committed such and such a violation, and this is the animal that I'm bringing. And, and the priest was responsible for the right animal, and the ritual was performed, and, you know, you, you know, you had the right dispositions, and so on. And then Leviticus 5 says, if all of this is done properly, then his, his sins will be forgiven. So, you know, the prophet didn't do this. The king didn't do that. The, the priest was the one who who dispensed the forgiveness of sins in the Old Covenant. And I invite my evangelical listeners, if we have some listening to this podcast, for example, go look at that yourself. And so think about what the implications are then in John 21, where, when Jesus breathes on the apostles and gives them this authority um, to forgive or retain sin. Again, this is, this is priestly authority. And what I try to what I try to show, Keith, I don't want to ramble forever here, but what I try to show in my book, um, Jesus in the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood, is that this is one of three uh, major priestly duties that are transferred from the old covenant, new covenant priesthood over the course of the Gospels. Um, so this is forgiveness of sin. Uh, some other uh, priestly duties that are transferred over are the interpretation of the law, uh, especially in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, and also the offerings of sacrifice, which is transferred over to the apostles at the, um, in the upper room at, at the institution of the Eucharist. So what we see basically in the Gospels is Jesus handing these priestly responsibilities over to his hand-picked men, and then, to make a long story short, when we look at the book of Acts, what we find there is the apostles exercising these yeah, yeah. authoritative roles and then choosing other men as their successors, a, a group of men uh, broadly termed as the presbyteroi, or the elders or presbyters, gives us our English word priest, and uh, sometimes uh, episcopoi or overseers, which eventually becomes our word bishop. At first, that that body of apostolic assistants, you know, they use the term presbyter and episcopoi, or episcopos or priest and bishop kind of interchangeably at first, but eventually those roles get distinguished as the church develops into her kind of adolescence, you might say. So there's this, this continuity of, of um, this 
priestly apostolic role is is passed on to other men, and we can see that going on in the Book of Acts. Yeah, I think that's the that's the incredibly shocking thing, right, for an evangelical listener, John, to go, okay, Doctor Bergsma, you've you've explained how the how there's similarities between the Old Testament covenant or, or priesthood and the what Jesus did with the apostles, this ability to forgive sins. Okay, but but that's just you know your interpretation. But no, <laughs> you look in the rest of the New Testament in Acts, and then in the early church you see that the apostles and the very first Christians understood this as well and understood that that authority passed on and that they could, say, in church councils, exercise that authority to make decisions on doctrine right, and all these kinds of things and celebrate the Mass, celebrate uh, you know, the, uh, a church service with, with uh, Christian followers. It was necessary to have a, a priest there. Right. And, and one of the marks I know for you and for me too, encountering quotations like from Ignatius talking about the, the, how you know how you know you're a Christian is if you're cleaved to the bishop. If you're right. if you're under a bishop, gosh, that's pretty shocking. You no, know, that, that that takes that claim from okay, I see I see parallels between the old covenant priesthood and the, what the apostles were doing. But then you you draw that further and you see, no, 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 this actually is how all the first Christians understood this to be, and that right. continued. That's taken to a whole other realm. Then you have yeah. to say, okay, well, well, where did that go? Right? Those yeah. Those are ancient biblical roots of a priesthood that we see keep going in the New Testament and, yeah. and beyond. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is, okay, I'm not saying anything original here, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, that's your interpretation, Dr. Bergson. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I'm getting this from Clement of Rome, you know, one of our earliest apostolic fathers. And, and what's, so in, what's so interesting for me, Keith, coming from a Calvinist background is, there are certain uh, theological issues that are very dear to the heart of Calvinists. You know, things like predestination and um, assurance of salvation and, you know, a, a whole bunch of other things uh, that are, you know, near and dear. And that's kind of central to our understanding of what Christianity is. But when you look at the very earliest Christian writings after the scriptures themselves, like the Apostolic Fathers, you mentioned Ignatius of Rome, we could also mention, I'm sorry, Ignatius of Antioch, we could also mention Ignatius, uh, sorry, Clement of Rome. Um, like, these guys are not concerned about those Calvinist issues. They're not taught them. What they are talking about is central elements of Catholic theology and ecclesiology, or, you know, or the, the way that the church works. And Clement of Rome, some people consider it the earliest of the apostolic writings, dating it as early as the year 80, uh, for example. And what is it concerned about? It's concerned about apostolic succession. And there's this fantastic passage in in First Clement, um, his letter to the Corinthian church. And uh, I, I quote this passage all the time. I um, I have it on a on a PowerPoint presentation when I'm doing presentation to priests about the history of the priesthood and I, I throw it up on the screen but this is out of um, out of uh, first Clement where he says look uh, to the high priest there are certain duties apportioned and likewise to the priests there are certain responsibilities and uh, to the Levites as well and then lay people should also keep to their station he's going through and describing the um, the hierarchical ordering of the Christian community. But what's so interesting there, Keith, is that he uses the Old Testament terminology. What he really means is the bishop, the priests, and the deacons. But he calls them high priest, priest, and Levites. He's just using the Old yeah, Testament yeah. terminology. Yeah. And so it, what it does is it shows that, hey, the early, the early Christians got this, they understood that there was this continuity between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and the, uh, the bishops, priests, and deacons uh, uh, who, who were chosen or, or selected by the apostles, they succeed to these responsibilities from uh, the Old Covenant. And, and I remember reading that for the first time back in 1999, while I was still an evangelical Protestant, and I just balked at that. I'm like, no, no, you can't say that. You can't use those Old Testament terms because Jesus abolished the Old Covenant. You know, he got rid of all that. And 
and that points up uh, th that points out Keith a very different way of understanding the relationship between the old and the new covenants in Protestantism versus Catholicism. It, a lot of times in Protestantism, the idea is you know the old covenant, uh, you know Jesus came and 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 abolished the old covenant and then replaced it with something completely different. Uh, oftentimes you get that kind of mentality, uh, whereas as Catholics, we say, no, uh, you know, the Lord came to elevate or purify that which was imperfect or was was only a type in the old covenant. He so it, I'll put it like this. Um, as a Protestant, I would have said Jesus came to abolish the Old Testament liturgy and replace it with no liturgy at all. Yeah. Whereas as a Catholic, I would say Jesus came to uh, to purify the Old Testament liturgy, which was symbolic, and to replace it with a real liturgy. So in Protestantism, the symbolic liturgy is abolished with no liturgy. And in Catholicism, the symbolic liturgy is replaced with a real liturgy that is efficacious. You know, again, very different way of of looking at it. So the priests under the Old Covenant could forgive sins only in a symbolic way based on hope on the coming Messiah, but priests in the new covenant can actually remit sins because the Messiah has come and has given them authority. It makes so much more sense that the new covenant would be real and effective, you know, and re would replace shadows and types with something real and effective than replace shadows and types with, with nothing. <laughs> Okay, yeah, but, yeah, but just yeah. you know, it's you and Jesus, and yeah. no liturgy, no priesthood, no sacraments, no nothing. Just you know, anyway. Yeah, <clears throat> because the principle at play there is that the new the, the the new covenant must be better than the old one. Better right? than the old. We're not going to abolish an old testament or the old right. covenant to establish one that's in, that's inferior. That includes nothing. That includes nothing. Right? We we say we have more access to Christ as a Protestant. Right? We, the the veil the veil has been re removed. We have more access to immediate forgiveness by by Christ, but but removing the liturgy, removing all these those different things. When, again, we see in the early church, well, they, they kept doing that, right? Justin Martyr, uh, in, in, very early on in, in early church history, we see a liturgy that looks an awful lot like the Catholic, like Catholic Mass happening right. from the beginning. So it wasn't as if the early Christians, the ancient roots of the church here, understood, oh yeah, liturgy, no liturgy, priesthood, no priesthood. No, they, they had a, a priesthood that continued. That I love that, that link with with Clement, Clement of Rome, right? Which again, almost made it into the New Testament. Like that, that was so early on that in some circles, some churches, they read that in, with, the, right. with the New Testament books, right? It's so early right. on and so well received by the early church. You see him making that connection. And then we see we see a liturgy happening from, from the beginning. So it wasn't as if these things were, were abolished. The early church understood it that way too, right? Right, right. They saw that continuity and uh, it really spoke to their hearts. And so in, in Christ, they saw that now we have a temple, a temple composed of human beings of the church. We have a real sacrifice that can actually remit sins. That sacrifice, of course, is the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ. Um, we have a, uh, a true priesthood. Okay, so priesthood, temple, sacrifice, those are all restored. And I'd like to point out, you know, Keith, that um, actually what you end up with in Protestantism is very much very similar to what you have in Rabbinic Judaism, which is the technical term for modern Judaism, really, which was the the outgrowth and the um, the legacy of the Pharisee movement. So many people, even my Judaism professor at Notre Dame pointed out that in modernism, look, you don't have a priesthood because rabbis are not priests. It's a very different thing. Rabbis are teachers. teachers yeah. You know, that's what rabbi means. It means great one. It's like our Latin magister, uh, you know, a, a, a teacher. So rabbis are not priests. Synagogues are not temples. They'll often be called like Temple Bethel and whatnot, but they aren't temples because there's no sacrifice there. There's no priesthood there. Synagogues are gathering places. That's what a synagogue means. They're places of prayer. They're places of, places of study. Um, you know, Beit Midrash, um, a house of inquiry or house of study. That's what a synagogue is. 
And uh, so you don't have a temple, you don't have a priesthood, you don't have sacrifice in modern Judaism. You have prayer that's substituted for sacrifice, for example. And that's basically what you have in Protestantism as well. Protestant pastors are not priests. Um, they don't have spiritual authority. Uh, they are largely teachers, and their only authority comes from the effectiveness of their teaching and their own personal, you know, qualities and virtues, yeah, yeah. and very much like rabbinic Judaism. So they gather around themselves a congregation, but, uh, you know, a Protestant church is not a temple because no sacrifice occurs there, and you got no um, no priesthood as well. So it's, it's really interesting. I've, I've even yeah. seen um, some Jewish authors admit um, I think John D Levinson uh, just a wonderful man got the greatest respect in the world for him he's a professor of Judaism and scripture at Harvard he may have retired uh, at this point uh, probably is as he's you know um, famous but um, in, in one of his uh, works I remember him pointing out that yeah you know in, in modern Catholicism you do have priesthood temple and sacrifice and so you have that continuity with the religion of ancient Israel with the old covenant, and you don't have those things in rabbinic Judaism and in Protestantism, both of which are religions of the book in a very different way and are less like uh, the uh, the uh, covenant of Moses and uh, the old covenant and what God was doing with his people throughout uh, the earlier scriptures. Yeah. And I think, you know, I had Dr. Lawrence Feingold on the show a couple of weeks back, and we talked about the Eucharist and the Mass and how different that looks, how a different Mass looks and sounds to Protestant ears or evangelical ears and eyes, right? You, you're hearing words like sacrifice, you're seeing the priest's investments, doing, doing things that really seem, you know, there's a tabernacle, for goodness sake. This seems right. very Old Testament-y. And, I, and, and the paradigm which you see that as an evangelical makes it look very strange, very ritual, very uncomfortable, very much like, well, isn't this like abolished? Like we're doing a, but, but through Catholic eyes, through, 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 the, 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 the paradigm of a Catholic who sees the continuity of the old and new covenant, who sees the fulfillment of, uh, of the priesthood, the, you know, that, that the renewal of that covenant, the, the re reestablishment of the, of the priesthood and these kinds of things. Like it's a, it's a paradigm shift that, is required, I think, to see what's happening in the Mass, why Catholics do that. Well, we believe differently about what happened in, in the old and the right. new, right? That's that's right. almost required to understand yeah. that. Yeah, there is. And I think unless you take the Catholic approach, you're left with real problems in terms of the predictions of the prophecies. Um, because for take Isaiah, for example. Isaiah makes prophecies about the continuity of the priesthood. Um, the very last oracle of Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 66, envisions this kind of end times or eschatological ingathering where uh, a, a great multitude of Israelites and Gentiles will flock to the purified Zion. And then from this great multitude that comes back, God himself will select uh, priests and Levites, you know, which seems to indicate that in the eschatological future, you know, the, the, the age to come, there's going to be still priests and Levites there chosen from the mixed multitude that, that comes from Zion. And if you have a paradigm or an understanding of the church in which you don't have any priests anymore and you don't have any Levites anymore, it's like, well, where did those prophecies go? Um, you know, this is, you know, other other examples could be cited, but uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is we need that element of continuity between the Old and the New Covenants in order to have a satisfying explanation for how the prophecies of the New Covenant that we find, for example, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel really have taken place and really been fulfilled in Christ. Yeah, yeah. I guess the the question then is: so the modern evangelical, you know, you and I in the pew, you teaching me in your pew, listening to you teach, say, for example, would see the would see would have to put something in the way of saying, okay, well, maybe the early church saw the priesthood as a thing that continued. They saw liturgical worship as a thing that continued and kind of was was fulfilled, was extended, what what was re redeemed in the new covenant under Christ and, and the apostles. But surely 
that passed away at some point because now we just have we have pastors and and the priesthood is a thing that got corrupted or something along the way. You're probably the wrong person to ask this because you converted. You know, you saw that and said, "Well, I'm going to become Catholic," because you couldn't explain that kind of corruption. But uh, uh, what, what would you say to to say, to to maybe make that evangelical person in the pew think a bit deeper about well, well, because you know what I mean. Like their explanation has to be, well, that passed away at some point. Right, the Reformation right. Was, re- was required to fix a broken church, but but where, why, and and how would would that system start and then get corrupted? I guess <laughs> right. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you're the wrong person to ask this question. Right. Well, I mean, that's what I thought. You know, um, well, I, I thought the church got corrupted, but I would say, uh, you know, Keith, what really was persuasive for me was that I thought that concepts like priesthood sacrifice, um, the authority of the church, I thought that those concepts arose as a corruption in the Middle Ages. And so when I saw that they were actually present at the ground floor of the growth of the church with the very earliest of the post-apostolic fathers, um, you know, with Clement and Ignatius and, and Polycarp and the like, I mean, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, when I read them, I thought I thought to myself, these guys think like Catholics. OK, yeah. <laughs> what's important to these guys is what's important to the Catholic Church, you know, with apostolic teaching, um, apostolic succession, uh, the visible unity of the church, um, submitting to the to the authority of the living voice of the church, uh, sacramental realism, you know, uh, the real presence of Christ in, in the Eucharist, for example, in that famous passage from uh, Ignatius, Letter to the Smyrnians, end of chapter 6, beginning of chapter 7, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of, of our Savior Jesus Christ, right? So um, this very, very, uh, very robust sense of the real presence. So, so seeing that these corruptions, so to speak, are really present there at the ground floor, so it's not you know, in the 12th century with, I don't know, Thomas Aquinas or something that you, that you begin to have people say, Hey, you know, there's this similarity between the structure of the church and the structure of ancient Israel. And, you know, so maybe we ought to start, you know, calling, uh, you know, our leaders priests or something like that. It's not in the 12th century. We're talking about maybe as early as the year 80 when Clement is saying, Hey, you know, the, the bishop is basically the equivalent of the high priest and the, um, the priests uh, of the church succeed to the priests of the old covenant and the deacons are doing what the Levites used to do. You know, it's, it's already there. So that early testimony uh, really was persuasive to me. And you might, you might ask the question, well, why didn't I just say, wow, you know, the church got corrupted so early. You know, it's like, the very first generation has already got off on the wrong track. Well, a couple of things kept me from doing that. One thought that occurred to me was like, that's basically Mormonism, okay? That's that's what Mormonism holds is that John the Apostle dies and everything went to heck until Joseph Smith, right? It, and it's kind of a, um, it's, it's a, like a reductio ad absurdum or it's like, the, the ultimate absurdity of quickly the church defected, you know? And so that's, and so I'm like, gee, if I take that view that, you know, Ignatius and Clement are wrong in seeing this continuity between old and new covenant, then I'm really, I'm really just like the Mormons. And I'm just saying that the truth was lost immediately and, and had to be recovered. And then, and then what do we make of scriptural promises? Like the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church from Matthew 16, you know, then, then it would seem that the organization that Jesus founded, you know, uh, completely defected immediately. And that doesn't speak well to, you know, the divinity and of Christ and our, our confidence in him. It kept me from saying that the um, that in and, and Clement and so on were just completely wrong is that I knew that uh, we need these guys to establish the canon of scripture 
See, a lot, I think a lot of evangelicals have not been involved in enough apologetic debates and maybe have never dealt with the question of like, how do we know that the New Testament comes from the apostles? How do we know that we can trust the New Testament? I was involved in those kind of debates, and one of the common moves that we made when debating with atheists or skeptics like Bart Ehrman is, and so on, it's like, how do we know that? element there is the testimony of the earliest fathers you know so i would teach and i would explain to people look you know we can be confident that john wrote john because you know we have the testimony of you know clement and and ignatius and irenaeus and the other fathers and they all are agreed and the tradition goes back very early and um you know polycarp and Papias and so on testify to these traditional ascriptions of authorship to the New Testament documents. So I knew that, so to speak, to, to make a case for Christianity, you need those early fathers. They're that, that uh, testimony to the authenticity of the New Testament, and I believe that to this day. So knowing, that, knowing their importance, I was like, hey, if I toss these guys out and say, hey, they're corrupt and they don't understand what the church is really about, then I'm, I'm losing also my testimony to the authenticity of the New Testament scriptures, if, if that makes sense at all. And, um, and I was like, I, I can't do that. If, if I just like dismiss them here, then what am I going to do later when I'm arguing with the skeptic to know why he should believe that Mark wrote Mark or John wrote John, you know, am I going to go and just, you know, uh, t accept their testimony here? So there's a kind of capriciousness about that, right? It's like, I'll accept their testimony when it yeah. suits me, yeah. Yeah. but when it doesn't suit me, I'm going to dismiss them. And for myself, I couldn't be that inconsistent. I was like, if I'm going to trust these guys and I have to trust them because they're the ones that, you know, provide testimony to the authorship of the New Testament, etc. If I'm going to trust them, then I have to like trust them consistently. And that means also, you know, their very Catholic view of what the church is all about and, and, and how that continuity between the Old and New Covenant comes about. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I experienced the, the very similar feeling, and lots of listeners to the show who who are converts to the Catholic faith experience a very similar feeling. Well, where you are you are reading a Bible, which is how you see yourself understanding your faith as an evangelical. This is the the sole, or at least the most authoritative way of understanding your faith. Right, is the Bible. But you begin to realize that, well, the, the Bible that I have, what's in that Bible, that was affirmed uh, uh, at. at in the same time, you know, I, I councils and by, by church fathers who said and did things that I don't agree with, right? right. You, you right. have church, you know, you have church councils who are affirming certain things about Mary or, or practicing, you know, within, within that council, there's, there's a mass where they're, you know, they're selling the Eucharist and believing the real presence. That same council then gives me the Bible. Well, how can I, how can I take the, the text of the Bible, but leave the other things they were, how can I take some of the doctrines they affirmed on the right. Trinity, but put aside other things they, they were also affirming at, at the same time? It right. becomes wildly inconsistent, like you say, and I think you get to a point where you either go crazy or realize yeah. I either have to ignore all of this or, or embrace all of this. You can't, you, just, you can't pick and choose, right? Those, the ancient roots of the, of the Catholic faith, it's, it's all or nothing. You can't, you can't right. take and leave certain things. It's, right. It's especially when you're saying, okay, the Bible is my sole authoritative, or my most authoritative, you know, uh, rule of faith for my Christian life. That comes from these guys who also said other things about, like, right. that's so inconsistent, right? Right, it right. Make any sense. Yeah, these guys that gathered together the writings of the apostles and compiled them and edited them and gave us our New Testament. Yeah. Well, they were also had this veneration for Mary and they thought that Jesus was really present in the Eucharist yeah, and all that. Yeah. Like, well, they were all wrong about that. The only thing they got right was the Bible, you know? That, I mean, that's, that's essentially the position that you have to take. And that seems, uh, you know, kind of uh, just uh, so um, cap capricious or um, idiosyncratic on the face yeah. of it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah.
Even the, this is interesting. I thought this recently. Joe Heschmar did a great episode on um, on the Apocrypha, the Deuterocanonical canonical books, and the idea that okay, so Jerome talks about how these books, you know, maybe he has a view of the books that was he was atypical. He wasn't the one, you know, the the consensus view when he made, uh, translated the Vulgate was that the Deuterocanon, you know, belonged in there. He had some reservations and put some notes in there. Well, Protestants might gravitate and you know, grab onto the notes that he wrote about. Oh, these books aren't valid because look, Jerome, who translated them, didn't agree with them. So obviously the church didn't didn't like them at this, at this time. Well, hey, what about other things that Jerome said and wrote about right. that, you know, the, the Eucharist, the bishops, these things, and the fact that he actually submitted to the church and did translate those books, right? right. You, you can't, even in later church fathers, it becomes right. really tricky to begin to pick and choose certain things from the ancient church and right. leave other things. Like, how do you yeah, make Jer- that yeah, distinction? Jerome was so adamant on, like, the, uh, uh, the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take Jer- Jerome over here when he's criticizing a Deuterocanonical book, but I'm going to leave to the side, you know, all that he says about Mary. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really quite crazy. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. You know, Gary Mashuda is one of the best guys on the whole deuterocanonical yeah. question, and um, I have I have a treatment of it in uh, my introduction to the Old Testament and Catholic uh, introduction to the Bible, Old Testament from Ignatius Press. But I'll tell you, Keith, I was so shocked um, when I was reading. Uh, Augustine's or on Christian doctrine, which is really, it's actually, the title is misleading to us, but uh, it's actually a manual on biblical interpretations. Like, this is how to interpret the Bible from St. Augustine. And he wrote it back in the, you know, the late 300s, and it was the standard manual for the interpretation of Scripture all the way uh, to the uh, time of the Reformation. Uh, They were still using it and still referring to it. and I have my I have my students to this day. That's we when I when I teach biblical interpretation, we start with Augustine and we read what what he says, and what he says is still valid, and it, it's just modified, but it hasn't been like rejected. But anyway, I was so shocked back in like it probably was the spring of two thousand, Keith. I was reading uh, Augustine on Christian doctrine, and it gets to the point where he discusses the canon, and he says, well. With the canon of scripture, what you got to do is you got to listen to the church. If there's disagreements within different churches, then go with the churches that are oldest and biggest. Um, they have the best say. And then, and then he says, and, and when you work that all out, when you apply these principles of you know going with the largest and the oldest churches, then this is the list that you end up with. And then he gives the list. He's got all the deuterocanonicals in there. I'm like, no, you know, <laughs> Augustine, you can't do this because you see, we were. As Dutch Calvinists, we revered Augustine. We we looked at him as the proto-Calvin, uh, you know, Calvin's predestinarian doctrines. He got those really from uh, Augustine's very late writings, his late polemical writings, where Augustine takes some kind of extreme stands on on some things, and um, and it's it's very odd because um, the Calvin focuses on those portions of Augustine's teaching, which was not really received and reaffirmed by the rest of the church, but like the 95% of Augustine that's received, affirmed, it becomes standard with the church, all that, that gets kind of jettisoned, you know? So it's, it's, it's a, really a, an odd way of, um, of uh, appropriating Augustine, but again, I, I, I'll never forget kind of the shock of seeing. I felt betrayed. A little glitch there. Yeah, absolutely, and even internally. You're still good. In, yeah. <laughs> And even internal to a church father, right? You, I, I've seen the, uh, defenses of sola scriptura from Augustine based on, say, these three quotes. But you look, 
you know, further in that, in the, in context of, you know, one of those three quotes and see that later on in that same passage, he writes about the authority of church councils and how those, those are, you know, also can't, are also infallible. You know, he uses the exact same word to describe scripture and a church council. So it's a matter of just even internally to a document from a church father, you're having to take some and leave some. So, you know, I, th- I think the, the bottom line is if you're looking at the, the ancient and biblical roots of the church, you have to take all the Bible says and all the ancient church shows us and can't take just pieces of that and run with it unless you want to live in some strange, very cognitively dissonant world, you know, paradigm, which I think, you know, we lived in as evangelicals. And when we began to realize that, then you begin to have right. to ask those those tough questions. But I think it's in so many times, it's not intentional, willful dissonance. It's just no. you don't know what you don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. And you and you, certain questions are just not asked, you know? Yeah. Uh, nobody, nobody, I was shocked when I, when I was first asked, okay, where do you, where do you demonstrate sola scriptura from scripture? You know, what scripture passage says sola scriptura the bio alone at first like oh there's dozens of them <laughs> you know like yeah. no wait and then you go through and like no that doesn't really say it that one doesn't really say it and of course everybody comes to uh you know second timothy three sixteen, all scripture is god breathed and 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 so on but even you analyze that and it does not say that scripture is all you need it says that scripture is god breathed and it's useful and 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 all of that i can affirm as a catholic um but it definitely does not say that it's the only thing that you need so um that's kind of a a self-refuting position then if if scripture itself does not teach uh sola scriptura um you're left with a kind of a doctrine hanging in the air and um that's of course uh you know very unsatisfying but um, yeah, continuity, Keith, um, you know, going back into the Old Testament, uh, seeing a, a pattern and a consistency about how God deals with his people, um, a, a pattern and consistency that leads to fulfillment and not abolishment. You know, these are much more satisfying ways of understanding uh, scripture and the history of the church. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Dr. Bergsma, always a pleasure to have you on the show. I want to thank you for joining us from your mobile office, moving around. Uh, the listeners and viewers won't see the part where you actually move the vehicle, so it, I, I can confirm it's a mobile office, and it's quite fantastic. Uh, thank you. All the links in the show notes to all your fantastic books, your website, anything you want to highlight for listeners uh, to, to check out in particular, other than what I'll already put in there for them? Yeah, definitely. Please check out my new book, Love Basics for Catholics from Ave Maria Press, um, where I go through and just tra- trace the theme of marriage from Genesis to Revelation. I think it's really eye-opening to just do that. And when you do it, you realize, oh my gosh, this is so central. You know, all through salvation history, like marriage is right at the heart of everything. And uh, and then you, you begin to realize why we're in such trouble in a culture that can't accurately define yeah, marriage yeah, and doesn't yeah. it's forgotten what it's all about but you know also you know the hope for the future really relies and, and requires us to recapture the truth about that so so love basics for catholics uh just out with the my characteristic uh, stick figures and stuff <laughs> so people true. that have liked bible basics are, are going to like this and then the other thing too keith is um we got a great new um uh uh, initiative at the St. Paul Center uh, here in Steubenville, where I work, uh, called Emmaus Academy. And what these are is it's an online streaming platform that people can subscribe to. And if they subscribe, they get access to these short, punchy courses that kind of address that middle ground between, uh, you know, basic catechesis for, and you know, going to a university and, and, and getting a degree in theology. What about that middle ground that most of us are yeah, in? Yeah. Where we just yeah. like, we'd like a little bit of refinement and sophistication in our understanding of, say, prayer life, the sacraments, the magisterium, things like that. Well, these are like eight to 12 uh, episode courses of like a half hour for each session. 
little self-testing quizzes and stuff. You get a you get a certificate after you complete a course, a little credential for the St. Paul Center. It's pretty cool. But uh, I think there's a lot of folks that want to go to that next level in their in their Catholic life and their understanding of spirituality and theology. And Emmaus Academy is is going to be a real good fit for a lot of your listeners. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people um, throughout North America, they're just looking for that next level. So yeah, all folks need to do is probably if you type in St. Paul Center Emmaus Academy into a search engine and hit return, it's going to pop up and folks can look at more of the specifics and get like a, a free trial and, and try out some of those courses. But I think people are going to really like it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've had a look uh, last week I had, or recently I had Dr. Feingold in the show and he yes. it was, he, he told me, well, I tried to make them half an hour lessons, but uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't quite stop talking. And I, 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 I totally understand. It's fantastic stuff. I had a look. It's awesome. So I'll put links to that in the show notes as well. And uh, an awesome initiative. And absolutely like the, the thing that many listeners to this show, I think, will love. So I'll put links there, too. And uh, thank you once again, Dr. Bergsma, for being on the show. God bless you and the work you're doing for the church. It's awesome. Don't stop. And uh, yeah. thanks for being here again. It's wonderful. Yeah, you bet, Keith. Likewise to you. Thank you for all you're doing. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I love your work. <laughs> thank you.